my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died.
173 from the last minute so far through the offering on the last course. 172, love lifting. I was sinking deep in sin from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me now safe. Love. Nothing else could help love lifted me. Souls in danger look above, Jesus completely saved. He will lift you by his love out of the angry way. He's the master of the sea, billows his will obey. He your savior wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help.
I got these bills. I knew you had those bills. Before you knew you were going to have those bills. That's all. Here's the problem. That's all right, Lord. I got this bill. My water heater blew up. My roof's got a leak in it. I got to go to the doctor next time. I don't have the money unless I take it out of my tithe and my offering, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to ask you to take care of it. That's what we're here for. As we take a moment, take up the offering, remind everyone this is time to give glory to God. If you're having an issue right now, it's a good time to say, Lord, I trust you with everything, including my finances. More powerful little green piece of the pot which is different. As we go to the Lord, I'm going to ask Brother Doug. Let's pray for him. Thank you for the opportunity. Let's pray for the pastor as he preaches this morning. I pray now for the offering.
of, of, of retail shops and uh, all those fun things. I'm going, wow, this is all hidden inside trees and green and you, you see nothing from the road. You just have to uh, happen on something unless you actually live there. I never saw one Walmart. I'm sorry, Miss Diana, Miss Nadine. I did not see a Walmart there. I did not see a Target. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's one there somewhere. <laughs> didn't see a Target. I didn't see a, uh, anything there. Uh, it was quite interesting. So anyway, I did find places to eat. Uh, so I did not go hungry. All right. Uh, by now you found Isaiah chapter number 1. Now please stand with me in reverence reading the Word of God. We're going to read verses 1 through 18. I'm going to speak to you this morning on the subject, When America Declared Her Independence. When America Declared Her Independence. All right. Isaiah chapter number 1, verse number 1 says, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Isaiah, uh, Jotham, and uh, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. Notice that phrase, the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the donkey his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord and have provoked the Holy One of Israel. Unto anger they are gone away backwards. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, and the whole heart is faint. For the sole of the foot, even uh, from the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither uh, mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Notice that. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land Strangers devour it in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Notice this, except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant. We should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like the Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Now, let me stop right there. He's talking to Israel. He's not talking to Sodom and Gomorrah. But the likeness of Israel is like Sodom and Gomorrah that was destroyed. Verse 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. And I delight not in the blood of bullocks, or of lambs, or of goats, when you come to appear before me. Who hath required this at your hand, to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me, I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear, your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from the before mine eyes, Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, and relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Let's look at verses 19 and 20. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Come now, and let us reason together.
saith the Lord. Verse 18, let's pray. Fathers, we bow before you again this morning. We thank you, Lord, for uh, your mercies and for your grace. And always as we read through the word of God, we see, Lord, your mercy. We see your grace. We see, uh, Lord, where uh, those who are of Israel and those of other nations have turned their backs upon you. Uh, Lord, and in your mercy and in your grace, uh, you uh, allowed them an opportunity to repent and to return back. And yet they continuously went forward further and further and further into sin. And Lord, you had no choice but to judge. But even in your judgment, Lord, uh, you left uh, a remnant. You left those that uh, would possibly repent and turn back to you. Father, I pray, uh, Lord, for America these, uh, today. I pray, Father, as we have celebrated yesterday the uh, independence of, uh, uh, of our nation, uh, celebrating the, the Declaration of 1776. Uh, Lord, I just pray, uh, Lord, that you'd help America return back to you. Speak to our hearts this morning. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. Now, I want to make one thing very clear uh, to you before we begin the message this morning. And that one thing is very that I want to make very clear to you. America is not Israel. Write that down. Mark that down. Commit it to your memory. America is Israel not Israel. Now there are some out there, some uh, theologians out there that teach a, what they call a replacement theology. A replacement theology. And what they've taken, they've said, is that Israel was cursed by God, and because Israel was cursed by God, and God has shined his light upon America, that now America is Israel. No, America is not Israel. Never has been, never will be. God made a covenant with the with the Israelites uh, back in from Abraham further on uh, from Abraham Isaac and Jacob that he would make a covenant with them he made a covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 uh, verses 1 and 2 I will bless them that bless thee I will curse them that curse thee and it has been proven throughout history uh, of the uh, uh, the history of Israel that God will bless those that bless them and God will curse them that curse them now, America has been uh, a supporter of Israel all of these years. From ni in 1945, uh, when we became a, a world power, not only economically, but uh, 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 militarily, as well as humanitarily, we, we became a world power uh, and su superseded many, many nations. A number of nations were destroyed at, at, during World War II, Russia, uh, Britain, uh, China, and a few other of these world powers, they, they lost that influence in the, uh, in the cultures and in the world, and America arose to that place. Uh, and we can see that in, uh, in our history. Now, America has always supported Israel. In 1948, America stood with Israel to become a nation. However, during the last Bush era, during the last Bush era, President Bush began to push Israel to give up land for peace. William Koenig did a, uh, wrote a, an excellent book on eye to eye, and he, he parallels the, the Bush administration uh, with Israel, and every time he pushed for Israel to give up land for peace, America was judged and judged and judged and judged and judged. Do you think that Katrina was a half, just a coincidence? <laughs> Do you think that Katrina was just a coincidence? Do you think the wildfires that, uh, that were going through in, uh, in 2005 and in those eras uh, that, that were destroying uh, acres and acres and millions of acres of land was just a coincidence? Do you think that the World Trade Centers was just a coincidence? No, all of this was doing was being done as they were pushing Israel to give up land for peace. What was happening? We were taking a turn. We're not supporting Israel anymore. Or we say it verbally, we're saying we support them. But in action, we're saying we don't support you. If you want peace, this is what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to recognize the Palestinian state. You're going to have to live peaceably, and you're going to have to give the Palestinians all that land and go back and keep going back. Keep giving up. Keep giving up. Folks, you cannot give up land and be right with God. 
Uh, let me repeat that statement. You cannot let, give up land and have the blessings of God. Not only <laughs> am I talking about America and Israel, I'm talking about you and your spiritual life. When you begin to compromise and you begin to back away and you begin to do what you want to do and follow your own plan and you give up your territory that's got God given to you by your faith and by grace of God and you start backing up and you start compromising and you start going away from God, God is not going to bless you. And God will not bless the nation of America, nor will he bless anybody else who compromises and goes away from God. Now, it's important that you understand where we're going. <clears throat> I'm going to share some things with you this morning. The reason I wanted to establish this is that America is not Israel is because we're going to use some scripture from the word of God that's going to bring back an idea uh, that you're going to say, oh, America is Israel. No, America is not Israel. I cannot stress that enough. But I think there are some biblical principles in the Word of God that help us to understand that God has blessed America abundantly above all that we could ask or think. When our forefathers landed at Plymouth Rock in 1640, what we saw was a nation that was beginning to be established, and God blessed that nation. In 1776, America declared their independence from England. It came with war. It came with bloodshed. But America stood firm. America stood firm. And I believe it was, correct me if I'm wrong, Brother Keaton, I think it was uh, uh, 1790, George Washington gave his first inaugural speech. He said, God will bless this nation if we stay with God. And that's a paraphrase. God will bless this nation. Now our current administration says America was not founded upon Christian principles. It was not founded upon biblical principles. He's prevaricating the truth. I don't want to call him a liar, but that's exactly what he is. The history that I learned in school is a total different history than what they're teaching in school nowadays. And what we need to understand and what we need to, to go back to is to realize that God established America as a godly nation because God's people stood firm and said, this is what we're going to do. God has blessed this nation, and God has, has abundantly blessed this nation through world wars. We began to see a rise of America. First World War, America was tried to stay out of the war. America entered the war. We helped to win the battle. In 1945, uh, when uh, the uh, uh, Second World War ended, then God blessed, and America literally became not only a financial power, but a world-dominating power. And America has dominated uh, the world in humanitarian purposes, in economic purposes, and has been used to help to police, so to speak, uh, the nations of the world. That's what happened. In 1948, Israel became a nation. You say, well, how does all this fit in? Well, I want to kind of follow along here. If you turn to Isaiah chapter number two while you're turning there, let me just lay this foundation. God is pleading with Israel to turn back to him. And a number of things that we saw in our reading from chapter 1, verse 1 to verse uh, 20, is what we saw is that even the spiritual climate of Israel was so depraved that God said, I'm not interested in your offering. I'm not interested in your prayers. I'm not interested in your quote-unquote spirituality. Because it doesn't exist. You're worshiping idols, you're worshiping false gods, you're giving yourself to those things, and I'm not going to bless that. And what's going to happen is, I'm going to destroy you as a nation. Now then, second uh, chapter of the book of Isaiah, look at verse number 10. He says, enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. 
For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up, and shall be brought, uh, sh he, and he shall be brought low, and upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, and upon the, all the high mountains, and upon the high uh, uh, the hills that are lifted up, and even upon and upon every high tower, and upon every fence wall, and upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all the pleasant pictures. And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day, and the idols shall utterly abolish. He shall utterly abolish. Now, I want you to notice that word uh, in verse number 15, and upon every high tower. I'm not going to go into all of the, the particulars of it, but the very first time the word tower is used, and it's the same Hebrew word that's used here in Isaiah chapter 5, the, it, the very first mention and the law of first mention in the word of God is always important. And it goes back to uh, Genesis chapter number 11 and the founding of Babel. They said, come now, go to, let us build us a city and a tower that reaches unto heaven. What did God do with that city? And what did God do with that tower? Why, why did he do what he did? Because of their pride, because of their arrogance, because of their idolatry, because they had lifted themselves up and exalted themselves and said, look, we're going to reach to heaven. God says, no, you won't. No, you won't. I will bring you down. In Isaiah chapter number five, uh, chapter number two again, what he's saying is he's like because of the pride and because of the arrogancy and because you've lifted yourself up and because you've exalted yourself, I will destroy the cities, I will destroy the tower that you are building for yourself. Now Israel in, in uh, 586 B.C. was destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar came in. Nebuchadnezzar went through. He, he destroyed the temple of God. He destroyed uh, their, their spiritual place, Solomon's temple. Now, let me help, help you here. That was supposed to be the place of worship. If you read through the kings uh, of, uh, of Israel from the divided kingdom uh, on from uh, to the end of, the, of the, that uh, era of Judah and Jerusalem uh, being the, the city of God, what they had done is they had brought in their own idols into the temple of God. And they had brought in what they wanted to do, and they had temple prostitutes, both male and female, that were living in the outer courts of the temple of God. They had set up their idols in the house of God. If you read Ezekiel, you'll find that what God says that, told Ezekiel, I want you to dig through the wall, I want you to look in. And what were they doing? They were worshiping Tamas. Who's Tamas? Islam. They were facing the east. They were bowing towards the east, towards what we would call Mecca. The priests, the religious leaders of Israel were doing these things. God says, no, you're not going to do this. This is not going to succeed. God destroyed Israel took them off into captivity, in Babylonian captivity, for 70 years to teach them a lesson. Those in Israel said, oh, Jeremiah, you're lying to us. We're not going to believe your report. They put him in prison. They even wanted to kill him, but that he was, his life was spared. And I, even Jeremiah, as Isaiah did, said, God is going to destroy your idols. God's going to destroy your nation. God, you, 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 you need to turn back to God. You need to repent because God always gives a message of repentance along with his judgment. Now you say, well, how does that filter into America? As I said, America became a world power in 1945. In a very few short years from that, I'm going to give you some things you will remember. Most of you will remember. Hopefully you'll remember. In, in January uh, of 19... 63, I think it was, March of 1963, the Supreme Court made an unprecedented ruling. Never before had the Supreme Court defined law this way. 
they made law rather than interpreting the Constitution the way it was written. And they made a, a, a Supreme Court ruling that you could no longer pray and or read your Bibles in public schools. In 1963, when all of this took place, there became a moral decline in America, a major moral decline. For those of you who lived during that era, you remember the love children. You remember the free sex. You remember the, the idea that, that you know, drugs was the, was the new thing, and, and marijuana, and LSD, and all of those drugs. Uh, the rock music glorified this departure from God. Rock music. They sang this song, Motorcycle Mama. We'll see the world on my Harley. Forget what your parents taught you. Forget what, uh, what you've learned. Hey, you just get with me on my Harley and we'll just, we'll just travel the world. Unwanted pregnancies skyrocketed. Drug addiction skyrocketed. And so as a result of free love, and as a, as a result of, uh, of live how you want to live, you don't have to pay the, any attention uh, to anybody, don't trust anybody under 30 years of age, all of these things came about. And a few short years later, in January of 1973, the, the U.S. Supreme Court made a ruling, not based on constitutional law, but by pressure of special interest groups and said abortion on demand is legal. Since that time, over 50 million innocent, unborn children have been sacrificed on the altars of free love. No restraint. Do what you want to do, live how you want to live. It's going to be okay. It's an interesting thing in 1973 that, that this took place in January, in March, the, it signaled the end of the Vietnam War. The only war America had ever lost up to that time. The loss of the Vietnam War was an embarrassment, not only to America as it existed, it was an embarrassment to the soldiers who fought in that war. If you remember during that time from 1969 to uh, 1973, I believe it was, uh, the, I mean, the, the support of the military had plummeted. Before it, World War I and World War II, when our soldiers came back from war, they were greeted by masses of people, praising them for what they had done and what they had accomplished in those wars. The Vietnam soldiers were maligned, hated, and spit upon. Legalized abortion, the biggest loss of America today. What is God saying? America, you're going down the tubes. You're losing it. You need to get right with God. God sent another warning to America. I'm fast forwarding through a lot of this. 2001, September 2001, September the 11th, three planes were hijacked by Islamic terrorists, and they flew, two of them, into the World Trade Center, the symbols of economic prosperity. The tallest towers in the known world at that time. September the 12th, Speaker of the House, Tom Daschle, I'm sorry, Senate Majority Leader, Tom Daschle, made a, a statement. If you turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter number 9, you'll see what his statement is. While you're turning there, it's interesting to note that the 365-day Bible uh, uh, that was put out 16 years before 19, uh, in 1985 included on September the 11th every year this verse prophetically they I don't think they knew what they were doing really Keaton. but they were they put this verse in 
the 365-day Bible for 16 years on September the 11th of each year. And this is what that verse says. Verse 8. The Lord sent a word unto, into Jacob, and in, uh, in it hath lighted... And, let me try that again. The Lord sent a word into Jacob, and it hath lighted upon Israel. And all the people shall know, even Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, that say, notice this phrase, in the pride and stoutness of heart. The bricks have fallen down, but we will build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. Senator Tom Daschle used that statement, saying, we will rebuild. <laughs> what he's thinking is he's calling America back and saying, look, th this is what's going to happen. But this is not a blessing. This is a curse. Because it's prefaced by verse number nine. It says, in the pride and stoutness of their heart. That's arrogancy and pride. Oh, our bricks have fallen down? That's okay. We'll build with hewn stones. Our cedars have been cut down. What will we do? We'll plant sycamores. Interestingly enough, the speech that George Washington made, that inaugural speech, was made on Church Street in the church that stood in the shadow of the World Trade Center. In the shadow of the World Trade Center. What did they do? The church was not destroyed in the fray, in the destruction of those World Trade Centers. But there was a cedar in the courtyard that was destroyed. You know what kind of tree they planted in this place? Second one. The bricks had fallen down, the World Trade Centers had fallen down. <laughs> What did they do? They went to the quarries of New York and they cut hewn stone and set the foundation of the World Trade Center. Those of us in church thought, well, this, this will wake America up. As Isaiah thought, as Jeremiah thought, as Ezekiel thought, as Jonah knew, three weeks, within three weeks, it had all played out. Nothing changed. America continued on its downward spiral of depravity, wickedness, and sin. I was telling Brother Keaton last night, I was saved in 1972, and I said, when I learned about the second coming of the Lord, I said, it has to be 1975. This world is becoming so wicked Surely 1975 is the coming of the Lord. 75 passed, and I said 85. It has to be 85. It has to be 95. It has, I mean, and, and the world has got, you know, back then, I, I was naive to think that the world could not get any worse than it was back then. And it's progressively gotten worse and worse and worse and worse. And the pride and arrogancy of America we said exactly what Israel said. You tear, you tear down our bricks, we'll build with hewn stones. You cut down our cedars, we'll replace them with sycamores. In other words, you're not going to destroy us. We're going to continue on. Bush said, we will come through this. We will rebuild. We will destroy the terrorists. Pride and arrogance. Pride of a nation. Where are we at now? Where we're at now is here. As we come into the 2015 just Two weeks ago, Supreme Court 
made an unprecedented room. Room. Count them. There's three. There's more, but there's these three that I just pointed out. No prayer in schools. No Bible reading. Ten years later, abortion on demand. And now in 2015. Same sex. Every state has to recognize it. Has to provide it. Has to accept it. If God judged us in 63, and God judged us in 73, God will judge us in 20. Now there's some biblical principles I don't have time to go into. And if I had time to go into them, I would definitely kind of connect all this together to kind of help you see. We are not Israel, but Israel was destroyed because of their wickedness and their sin and their idolatry. America is being destroyed because of its wickedness and its sin and its idolatry. Now, folks, in 1776, we declared our independence to God. We accepted God as our overseer, as our guide, as our principle for living. Now, we have declared independence, not of God, but from God. And this is where we stand today. What's God going to do? I don't know. But do you know that rabbis in Israel are now saying that the Messiah is coming this year. You say, no man knows the day nor the hour. No, no man knows the day or the hour. Nobody knows that. I don't know that. They don't know that. But do you realize that a number of years ago, Israel said the God out of their government, out of their schools, out of their daily life, now the rabbis are saying, hey, wait a minute. The Messiah's coming. The Pope of Rome says, he made that statement, but he was probably full of wine. This recent statement. He was probably full of wine, and he just probably said something he didn't really mean, like all of us did. The, is, the, the, the Islamists are looking for also a Mahdi, a Messiah. Which one's going to come? The Antichrist is going to come, definitely, through Muhammad. But the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, is coming. We don't know the day or the hour, but he is coming. So what can America do? I think of what America can do is turn back to God. It's not going to be the unsaved that are going to cry out to God. It's going to be the saved. Those of us who have a true, honest relationship I don't have time, but it'd be great to study the Great Awakenings. First Great Awakening happened in the 1700s. The gospel's being preached. Thousands, literally thousands of souls are being saved. The Second Great Awakening happened in the late 1800s, early 1900s, or mid-1900s. Finney and all of those began to preach, and the great move of God came across America. Souls were being saved, lives were Third, what they call Great Awakening. It's not really a Great Awakening. It's a charismatic movement. But what? People weren't being saved. People were pushed to the Holy Spirit to speak in tongues and healing. You see where we're going? Folks weren't being saved. The, gr the Fourth Great Awakening happened just not too long ago. Where they started out with this laughing revival. What a joke. They call that an awakening. It's not an awakening. America needs a great shaking of its, of its borders. Not with laughing revivals, not with uh, uh, faith healers and, and that type of thing. It needs men of God like Finney and Edwards and Spurgeon and Moody to once again proclaim the truth of the Word of God and souls be saved, lives be changed. That's what needs to happen. If you're here today and you're unsaved, I could not plead with you 
more today than any other day. And as the time approaches, it's getting more and more urgent that you make a decision for the Lord to save Jesus Christ. You need to make a decision for Christ. If you do not know 100% sure for a viable reason you have a home in heaven, you need to make that sure today. Because we do not know the day nor the hour. 